something strange. Uh, when I was in the bed, my wife says that, you know, the doctor said, hey, you know, his feet are getting like really rough on the bottom. And they started bleeding. And 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 they're like, does he have a condition? And and she goes, No, he barely walks barefooted. He takes care of his feet. And then they're all like, Well, that's strange. And then one of the nurses in there, she goes, she said, Hey, you know what? He's walking. He's, you know, that that looks like you know, his feet are wearing out from walking. It's it it is crazy, okay? It is crazy because my feet were wearing worn out from walking barefooted. And I was laying on the bed. I was laying on the bed and, 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 you know, nurses and, and doctors and my wife, they were all looking at my feet, getting all worn out, all messed up. And I was just laying on the, on the bed. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome once again to the Recovery After Stroke podcast. This is episode 243 and my guest today is Rafael De Leon, who neglected to take his medication that he was prescribed for high blood pressure and as a result experienced a brain hemorrhage aged 54. Rafael De Leon, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. What happened to me? Um... I was at work, you know, normal day. Uh, you want me to tell you the story? How I got Yeah, to... I'd love to know, okay. man. All right. So I was at work, normal day. I'm an operations manager. So I was making sure that everything was, you know, it was Friday afternoon. You know, I was making sure that everything was ready for the next week, you know. And uh, and it so happened that I, want, I, I was going to have the parking lot painted. So I was making sure we have an electric gate and I was making sure that the electric gate had the proper code to open for the guy, for the painters on the next day. So, you know, having said that, you know, I went to, um, you know, I went to the back of the warehouse. There's a guy that that closes the, you know, in the warehouse, we, we are about 50 people in, during the day on a Friday. So I went to go look for my, you know, my friend Sergio, one of the employees. Uh, he was nowhere to be found. I guess he was, he had gone home already. So I went, I went to my office. I took a breather. I sat down, you know, logged out of the system, closed the lid on my computer. And then I put it in my backpack. But when I put it on my backpack, there was, there was some tingling on, on, on my torso. There was a little tingling and I, I sat down I was like, wait a minute, what, what is this? Because you know, usually when, when you get tingles in your body is because you've been sitting too long and, mm. you know, your body is like, you know, it reacts, right? Mm. But this tingling, when it started like, you know, traveling from, you know, from my arm to my foot. And, and I was like, okay, this is odd. So I got up and when I got up, I immediately fell down, fell down to the floor under my desk. And and when um, when I was under my desk, I was like, oh my God, I can't move, you know, nothing worked on, on the left side of my body. And, you know, I started panicking. Mm. Like, oh my God, what is this? You know, I, I, th this is crazy. I mean, you know, and, and all of a sudden I figured, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack. I have never heard of a stroke in my life didn't know what what a stroke was I never had a family member never knew anybody who had a stroke before never never you know after you know like I would say about three years ago I was talking to my one of my uh, half sisters in El Salvador and she told me you know that my father died of a massive heart attack but before he had the heart attack he had a stroke right but I didn't know that until about three years ago. That was, you know, and, you know, when I went back to the doctor, I always kept telling them, no, there's, you know, there's cancer in the family. There's, you know, heart condition, you know, arrhythmia. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, but no one's died of a, uh, no one's had a stroke. Mm. To my surprise, my father died of a, you know, stroke and then a massive heart attack. Yeah. So, but anyway, so. 
And so I closed the lid on my computer. I fell down on the on the ground and uh, and I was trying to reach for my for my phone, you know, on my desk phone. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't move. I couldn't get up. And I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And then um then it hit me. I'm like, my phone, I was charging my phone on my desk, my cell phone. And I, I go, okay, that's it. I'm I gotta get to my phone. So I tried again through all kinds of paper that, that were on my desk on the floor. And I couldn't I couldn't get to the phone. So then it hit me. I'm I'm like, you know, hey Siri, you know? Uh-huh. So I use Siri. Okay. okay. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so but anyway, I use I Siri for, you know, I, I, I said, hey, you know. Call nine one one, and uh, I don't want Siri to call nine one one right now. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> Let me. Uh, no, I don't know how to cancel it, but but anyway. So uh, so I I asked her to call nine one one, and then I got a, I I got a computer answering, and the computer said that it didn't. You know, you know, this system does not take calls from Siri. And oh. I was like, oh crap, you know, and then uh then I called my wife and uh and my wife, girlfriend at the time, I married after. Um I I called and uh and she was charging her phone. She was cooking and she had her phone on the bed. She was charging her phone. So this is what she told me, right? And then then I called you know, my my, my uh, one of my daughters. I have two daughters. I called her and uh, Siri couldn't make the call because I have a sister named Maritza and I was calling Marissa, which is my daughter. Cancel Siri. <laughs> Hold on, okay, sorry. Let, let me turn it <laughs> so I was So I was trying to call Marissa and Siri kept calling Maritza and then I, I said, cancel. And then I called my youngest daughter and I, and I, you know, I said, Hey, you know, Siri called Nicolette, who was my youngest daughter. And, and she picked up on the first ring. And I told her, uh, Hey, mamas, you know, don't freak out, but I'm on the floor and I can't move. And she's like, what do you mean you can't move? I go, I don't know. I think I'm having a heart attack because I can't move. I can I I can only roll on the floor and but I can't move. I can't get up. Can you come and get me? And she told me, "What do you mean come and get you? Want me to call 911?" And I go, "Yeah, call 911. Tell them I'm on the floor. I'm under my desk and I can't move." And uh so she called. Uh that was around 6 6:45, you know, around 8 p.m. Uh, or, or I think it was six forty-five. Maybe it was, you know, I, 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 I was on the floor rolling. I don't, I don't know. I, I, the last time I, I looked at my phone, it was six forty-five. Mm -hmm. Maybe I rolled on the floor for a long time, but you know, uh, the paramedics came around eight p.m. They knocked on my, you know, glass window. You know, it's my my office has a you know uh, a window in the back. It's the whole wall is a window, and they and they told me, sir, sir, can you move? And I go, no, I can't. And then they asked me, hey, how do we how do we get in? And I said, uh, I don't know, break something because it's a it's a high security office, right? So they ended up going around and they um. On the receiving docks of the warehouse, they they forced their way in in one of the roll up doors, and then they came in. And luckily, the office one of the girls and you know in the office left one of the windows open, and that's how they got into the office. How dramatic, man! This I can't yeah. believe what you had to go through to get somebody to help you. It's yeah. dramatic, and I can't believe that the phone doesn't allow you to call emergency services. Yeah, Siri. I mean, the phone doesn't. You know, nine one one does not take calls from Siri. That's weird. And you know, that's you know, it, it you know, it happened to me. But anyway, so well, well, I was on the floor waiting for the paramedics too, and I forgot to mention that. 
uh, I kept coughing because uh, I, you know, I watch TV mm -hmm. and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a couch potato, but you know. I know what you're going to say. Nerd and all that, yeah. But uh, cough, it's a good thing because it could help you if you're having a heart attack, right? Yeah. Okay. So back in the days, I saw this. Uh, I was watching this. Uh, I forgot what program it was, but it was Red Fox. Red Fox was being interviewed by somebody. And then, you know, Red Fox had a heart attack and he was on the floor. And then he says that he, his best friend was a cardiologist. And he told him, hey, keep coughing because that brings oxygen to your brain. And then you can, you know, you can wait until help arrives. So I remember that when I was on the floor and I kept coughing and coughing and coughing. So when the paramedics came, I was coughing and they were like, are you, are you all right? And, and then I go, yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I can't move. I don't know what I have. And they said, oh, hey. And then, you know, and then I stopped coughing because I'm like, okay, finally, they, you know, I'm someone that's going to help me. And then yeah. they, they, they took me, they took me to the hospital. You know, and I was alert until the like, you know, until the minute that, you know, they were deciding, you know, what they were going to do with me. I until about midnight, I was I was awake. What then, um, what was the cause of the stroke? Just a quick break and we'll be right back to the interview. As a stroke survivor, I understand the difficulties of finding the right information about post stroke nutrition. That's why I developed the course Five foods to avoid after stroke. While most people are talking about what to eat after a stroke to support brain health and recovery, very few are talking about what you should avoid eating after a stroke. If you want to support your brain to heal, are curious about the five foods that may make matters worse when you consume them, then you may benefit from this course. In the fun five series of interviews, you will hear about what foods not to eat after a stroke, but most importantly, why not? from a qualified nutritionist, Stacey Turner, and performance coach, Matthias Turner. In the more than five hours of interviews, we discuss the five common foods that cause inflammation in the body and brain, and how they could interfere with healing, and how they may make fatigue worse. For just $49, this five-part series of more than five hours of interviews with full PDF transcripts for download, MP3s for download, and videos will give you everything that you need to know about the five foods to avoid and why. The modules include eight reasons to quit sugar after a stroke, seven reasons to quit caffeine after a stroke, eight reasons to quit gluten after a stroke, six reasons to quit dairy after a stroke, and six reasons to quit alcohol after a stroke. And probably that is one of the most important things that you have to and should quit after a stroke. It's interfering with your recovery. Visit recoveryafterstroke.com slash courses for this and other specifically designed, short and easy to understand courses that are made by a stroke survivor for stroke survivors. Once again, you'll get more than five hours of content. All audio is available to download in MP3 format for listening on the go. Full transcript of all the content to take notes on or read instead of listen to presented by a stroke survivor for stroke survivors also presented by a trained nutritionist and performance coach you will also get 24 hours of access lifetime access to courses purchased and you'll be able to interact with yours truly in the comments section go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash courses to check them out now it was a mixture of um so I had high blood pressure and I used to take my medicine on and off. You know, I, I thought, Hey, I'm exercising. I, you know, I'm lifting weights. I, I'm, you know, I'm working out. I'm kind of eating healthy, but I was overweight, but, uh, and so I figured, no, nothing's going to happen to me. You know, I don't, I don't need the high blood, you know, high blood pressure medicine. So so I would stop for a while and then I would start taking it. So it was, uh, I, I wasn't taking care of myself. Okay. Yeah. And finally it, it, it got to me, you know, I, I guess I had an aneurysm and, uh, and a blood vessel burst and, and then I had a major bleed. You know, when I woke up from a 22 day coma, you know, 
the doctors were, you know, they were telling me as soon as I, I was able to talk to people that, you know, that I was some sort of miracle because no one, they, you know, my girlfriend and my wife now, she fought the doctors, she fought the surgeons because they didn't want to operate on me. They said, oh, it's useless. You know, no one, no one survives this. Wow. So you yeah. went to hospital, you were awake the entire time until really late in the evening. Yeah. And then you fell into a coma. Actually, the coma was induced because uh, they said that they, they needed for my brain to rest. And, and they were going to do a um, an operation, you know, uh, they had uh, uh, craniotomy. Called, yeah, the craniotomy. Yeah, they did a craniotomy. And they needed for you know for my because my 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 brain was swollen uh -huh. from the it bleeding. Was swollen, yeah, and it was a major bleed. And they said, you know, and, and they kept telling my wife, you know, they they kept saying, you know, he's not going to survive. He's not going to survive. You know, we're going to do it because, you know, you're pushing us. My, you know, she even got me. She was she was gonna have me transferred to UCLA. I was in uh, PIH Pres Presbyterian Hospital, and she was gonna have me transferred to UCLA because they didn't want to do the operation. So they finally said they agreed. They said, "Okay, fine, we're gonna we're gonna operate him." But you know, just so you know that he might die, in, you know, in the OR and in the OR. And she said, "I'll take those chances," and and you know, and the wow. doctor said, "I'm ready." And then she, and then he goes, and then, and then the doctor said, okay, just so you know, um, he, the percentage, the percentage, the survival percentage is very low. Uh, I don't know what percentage that was. I think it was between tw 10 and 20%. And, uh, and she said, don't worry about it. I already asked God to bless your hands. And he, she said that the doctor rolled his eyes and he said, hey, I've been doing this for 30 years, lady, and I don't need God, you know, I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> And she goes, okay, that's fine. So <laughs> I asked him anyway. <laughs> yeah. So 22 days later, I woke up, you know, uh, I woke up, I was, I was in a room. First of all, I had, a, I had the craziest experiences while I was in a coma. I went into a different place, mm -hmm. different spot, you know, but that's, that's another story. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, uh, no, you know, let's I'm, talk about it. Let's talk about it, Rafa. Tell me, where did you go, man? What did you see? Where did I go? Okay, so... If you don't mind talking about it, that is. No, no, of course not. Of course I don't mind. Uh, so it, I know it was 22 days. They said that I was out. But in the place that I, that I went to, that I, that I traveled to, it was... Uh, months. It was months. I would, I wouldn't go to sleep, but it it all started out like you know, like waking up every morning, and walking and walking and walking, and um, I was in the streets of Los Angeles, and uh, and all the buildings were the same at the same height. No no building taller than I would say ten stories high. Mm -hmm. and they were all brick buildings and I knew the place and I walked and I walked for miles and um and I was barefooted I I don't like walking barefooted to me it's gross I just don't care for it mm -hmm. you know I always have to have shoes on even when I go to the beach I have my water you know my water shoes I don't mm. like feeling of the ground you know and uh, I mean that's just me yeah. but, um, but anyway so I was walking on the streets of Los Angeles, right? Day after day after day. And I would walk for my, I mean, for like, I would say like 30 blocks at a time. And, and I always ended up in the same spot and I would be looking around and looking at the buildings and I'm like, oh my God, I know this place. So why can I get back to where I'm supposed to go? So I walked and walked and walked and you know, something strange uh, when I was in the bed, my wife says that, you know, the doctor said, hey, you know, his feet are getting like really rough on the bottom and they started bleeding. And and, and they're all like, does he have a condition? And, and she goes, no, he barely walks barefooted. He takes care of his feet. 
And then they're all like, well, that's strange. And then one of the nurses in there, she goes, she said, hey, you know what? He's walking. He's, you know, that that looks like, you know, his feet are wearing out from walking. And, and swear to God. That, oh, that, man. <laughs> I, you know what? What an amazing story. It's, uh, it, it is crazy, okay? It is crazy because my feet were wearing worn out from walking barefooted. And I was laying on the bed. I was laying on the bed and, 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 you know, nurses and, and doctors and my wife, they were all looking at my feet, getting all worn out, all messed up. And I was just laying on the, on the bed. And, um, but anyway, so that went on. I, I walked for many, 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 many days. I would say months. I would wake up uh, or I would like start up every time. Like I said, it felt like waking up every morning. And then and and I would look at the sky. The sky was brown, brownish, like a sepia color on a on a, on a photograph. And the sun was always like it was always like an afternoon. It, it was never morning. It was never the, you know, I I looked in the sky, there was no signs of the sun. Mm -hmm. but it was a bright, a brownish day. And I would walk every day, every day, and I wanted to get, I wanted to get back home. And I remember having this, you know, having the stroke, or having something, right? Because I didn't know what a stroke was. I I remember having a heart attack that I was on the floor, and I was like, oh my god, is this, is this hell? I didn't want to say it, but I thought, you know, if I say it, it can become hell. But uh, I I would look, I would look up, and I would look everywhere. There was no sounds of any kind. It was all mute. Mm -hmm. But I would walk and walk and walk and, and, and trying to get back home. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. And then one day, uh, I noticed that there was another road and I, and I looked at the road and I was like, okay, that's different. That's, that's a different road. I haven't seen that road before. So I walked to that road and then at the very end of the road, I saw something like, looked like Dodger stadium, like the baseball, you know, mm -hmm. uh, stadium. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is that thing? So I walked towards it. On the way there, you know, it was a long, straight road to uh, to the stadium, right? And I saw this guy with long hair going across the road, and and there was like a um, uh, it was a truck, but it was not really a truck. It was like a one of those tandem trailers, uh, you know, with a fifth wheel mm -hmm. going up and down like a little hill. And and the guy that was going across the road, he was, you know, he was picking up people and telling them to get on the truck. And and I looked at him and, you know, I passed him by, you know, I looked at him and I was like, oh, we're a weirdo, right? You know, but this is the first time that I was actually, I, I saw people. And so I just kept going to Dodger Stadium, right? Or whatever looked like Dodger Stadium. So when I got there, when I got to the place, <laughs> the um uh it looked something like um i don't know if you remember myspace you know mm -hmm. the the program myspace mm -hmm. so in the background it looked like i'm one of those myspace backgrounds you know and there was music and uh 
and the guy that the uh it, it, it was like uh like a swap meet like uh you know a place where they sell knickknacks and stuff you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then i i looked at the guy and the guy looked like my boss right and i was like what the hell are we doing in here but uh but i didn't talk to the guy and there were two gypsies and they had like this you know the stand and they had pictures on the on 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 the stand and and then i i one of them approached me and she goes uh what what do you need and then and i said uh ah uh, you know what i'm trying to get back home but i don't know how and this is the first time that i'm actually talking to anyone and she goes and she goes really and she goes won't you take something from the uh from the store so i just went and grabbed two pictures of you know the virgin mary okay mm -hmm. and, and, and then I looked at them and I gave them to her. And then she goes, oh, okay. And then she gave me a marker. And when she gave me a marker, she goes, just write something in the back of the picture. I go, what do you want me to write? And she goes, anything, anything that comes to mind. So I, I, you know, I flipped the picture and then I wrote my name and my, you know, my wife's name on it, right? I, I said, Ralph, and then on the bottom, Cindy. And then I gave the pictures back to her. I only wrote in one of the pictures. She looked at the picture and then she goes, oh, you still have business up there. I go, oh, business up there? Where's up there? And she goes, oh, the place where you need to go. You know, you're saying, you, you say that you want to go back home. That's, that's where you need to go. And I go, yeah, how do I get back there? And she goes, see that guy over there? And then she pointed at the guy that I told you, the crazy guy that was running across the road from, mm -hmm. you know, from one end of the street to the other. I mean, uh, you know, across the street from one yeah. side to the next and picking up people and putting them in the truck. And and then I go, um, okay, so what do I tell him? She goes, just show him the picture. And just show him the picture, go tell him that you need to go back home and show him the picture. And I go, okay, thanks. So I, I went down the road again, stopped the guy. The guy smiled at me. It was like, you know, the greatest smile in the world. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it's it's cool. This guy is really cool. Right. And he he had a face like I had seen him before. You know, this greenish, brownish eyes, you know, hazel eyes. And for some reason I trusted the guy. And and I looked at him and I was like, oh yeah. Uh they told me that that I should ask you, you know, the gypsy back there told me that I should ask you. I should show you this and you will tell me how to get back home. And then and then he looked at the picture and then he goes, uh, you know what? You still got business up there. And I go, where is up there? She told me that I got business up there, but where is up there? I just want to go home. He goes, tell you what, just get on my truck and see that hill over there. And he pointed down on the road and there were no more buildings. You know, it was just the hills. He goes, see that hill over there? He pointed at a little hill. She, he goes, I'm going to take you half, you know, half ways. I'm going to drop you off on that hill over there. And, uh, and you know, I, and then you can go back home. I'll tell you how to get back home. And I go, okay. So, so I got on his truck. And, uh, and when I got to, the, when I got on the truck, I fell to the floor, you know? And I was like, what a dummy, right? And then, and then. And then he just looked at me and picked me up. He just picked me up from, you know, from up there, way up there. <laughs> and I and I was I freaked out because I was like, oh my God, this freaking guy is strong. And 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 I realized, man, how did his arm get so long to pick me up from the floor? But I didn't think anything of it. When I was telling one of the guys, you know, when after I woke up from my coma, I told him the story about this one guy. And then he's very religious. And then he goes, dude, you don't realize who that was? <laughs> and I go, no. And then he goes, dude, you're stupid. Don't you know that you met Jesus? <laughs> and I was like, what? And then I, you know, I, I was like, oh, my God. My whole life, I said, you know, we used to get around when we we're kids. You go, hey, what if you see Jesus one day? What would you tell him? And I had all these things in my head. Oh, I would tell him this, I would ask him this, I would ask him that. And then when, you know, when Peter, my friend, you know, was telling me that, that I had seen Jesus, I was like, dude, all I said, how do I get back home? You know, 
that's all I had in my head. I had all these things to tell him, and that's what I said to him. <laughs> but that sounds like it was your mission anyway. And it sounds like everyone was on board with your mission and your wife was on board. Everyone was yeah. on board. So I think you asked him the right question, you know, if, if, yeah. you, and, if yeah. that's, uh, uh -huh. that's, a, a, that's an amazing story from the perspective of you're, you're telling it so vividly, you're explaining it in a way that's so dramatic. You're a great storyteller. Uh, and it's really engaging. It's like lovely to hear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whatever. It is what it is to you. Whatever it means, it seems like it means a lot. And if it helped you get back to be where you are right now, I think that, that's an amazing thing, man. Yeah. So so he puts me back on the truck, right? Puts me back on the truck. And then, you know, then he starts going. We get to the hill. He goes, okay, this is where you get off. And I go, okay. And then he he said he said to me, uh, you know, it was a fork. He goes, see that road right there? And it was a straight road. Uh, he goes, you're going to walk 22 miles. 20, exactly 22 miles. And when you get to the very end, that's where you need to go. Do not look to the side. Because there's going to be a lot of... Uh, a lot of distractions. And and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention when I was in Dodger Stadium, I, I had the same thing. You know, yeah, my my wife. Uh my my brother who passed away in 2005 came and told me, hey, let's go, let's go down there because it's happening. And they were having a party, you know, uh, uh, downstairs you know, on the ground and in, in Dodger Stadium. And and then he had a couple of friends who passed away too. And I looked at both of them and I looked at all three of them and I'm like, wait a minute, these guys are dead. I'm not going to follow these guys because if I go down there, that's it, I'm dead. Mm -hmm. But, and then when I got, when, when, when this guy was telling me to not to look to the sides because there were going to be a lot of temptations just to walk 22 straight miles. I was like, okay. So I started walking. He, he left, he went on the other road. And then, uh, and then I started walking, and the first thing that I saw that that I that I did was look to the sides because you know, people like to disobey. And then it sounded like there was parties going on. So when I looked to the left, you know, all the guilty pleasures of in the world were happening, and it was very tempting. You know, I wanted to join in, and I was like, oh wow, this is cool. I looked to the right, same thing, same thing. But then, then I, then I remember this guy told me to walk 22 miles, mm -hmm. so, and at the end of the road, I was gonna find, you know, my way home. I said, forget it. I'm not, I'm not joining. I'm not going. So I walked and walked and walked. What seems like an eternity, you know, days. I walked that road, and finally, when I got to the very end, there was a chapel, very illuminated chapel. It, it, it was bright almost blinding and I looked at it and I was I stopped and I and I thought oh no heck no I'm not going in there because I don't know if uh, if you remember when they say if you see a white light don't go in it because that's the end <laughs> <laughs> but then but then the guy said to go you know to go to go to the very end because that's oh. what I, you know that was my way home so I just looked at it and then and then the doors were wide open tall doors like you know like 12 feet tall or I don't know 20 feet tall really really tall doors but they were open so I went into the chapel and then the chapel was all illuminated it was all bright and then I uh, I looked and 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 I was like oh god what is this what is this place and then I saw one of my co-workers you know, who doesn't work for the company anymore. He was there and I, I looked at him, you know, and he was sitting in one of the benches. And then in the altar, there was my, you know, my wife was had a rosary and she was kneeling down and she was praying. And I, and I walked up to her and I was like, oh my God, you know, finally, I think I made it home. So when I was going to talk to her, the lights went on. The lights went on, and 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 there, and, and I heard in the background, "Hey, he's waking up! He's waking up!" 
And, and, and then I looked and it was the room, it was the room in the hospital. And they were like, oh, he's waking up, he's waking up. And everybody's like, you know, they're coming towards me in the bed. And I looked and I was looking around and, and I saw the lights in, in the room. And I was like, where am I? And then they were like, hey, hey, hey. And they kept talking to me and, and they're like, you know where you are? And I go, no. And, uh, and, and then they said, well, you're a PIH in Whittier, California. And I go, no, I'm in Australia somewhere. And I was, <laughs> for some reason, I, was, I kept saying that I was in Australia. And they said, no, no, this is Whittier, California. You're in PIH. Do you remember you had a stroke? And I, and then it, it hit me right. I was like, oh, yeah. And then my wife comes up to me and she goes, hey, it's me. It's Cindy. And I looked at her and I'm like, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. Ooh. And she goes, it's me. It's me. And I, and I was like, no, I don't know who you are. I don't know how you are. And, and then I saw my mom and I was like, you know, I cried and I was like, hey, I'm back. I don't know where I went, but I'm back. And then, um, and then, you know, she comes up to me and she goes, hey, it's me. We've lived together for nine years. You know, it's me, it's Cindy. And, I, and I'm like, oh, okay. And, and I go, what's your mom's name? And she goes, my mom's name is Gloria. And then I and then I I remember something right and and then and then she goes uh, and I go do you have do you have kids and she goes yeah I have two sons remember and I go yeah Daylan and Amy right and she goes yes yes and then I go oh, okay okay I remember you now mm. and that, that's how I woke up man that's that's, that's my story from trippy from that's my stroke to, to when I woke up. That's and a then, trippy, trippy story. Yeah. You know, I, I could just see somebody turning that into, into a short movie. You know, thirty minutes <laughs> or, or or twenty two minutes, where you just it opens with somebody just walking, sepia, dark, bright, just walking, meeting all these people, having a conversation, going to the light, and then yeah. waking up yeah. in a hospital, going, "Whoa, where am I? What am I doing?" Well. I they they told me, hey, you better write down that story before you forget it. And mm. I, I told them, I'm not gonna forget it. <laughs> I was there. I was there. I lived no chance. it. How can you forget something so so weird, so nice at the same time? Yeah. So and you I, so you were in, in hospital for 22 days in a coma after the surgery, yeah. and then you woke up, what kind of deficits did you have? What did you have to learn to do again? <laughs> um, so so I, I stayed in the hospital for two months. And between those two months, I had therapy. Uh, the, the whole left side of my body did not work. I couldn't move. My arm was swollen. My arm, you know, my hand was like, you know, really swollen. I couldn't move it. You know, one day I woke up and I was I was moving my thumb and they were all excited. Oh, my God, he's moving. He's moving. But I was alert. I, I was talking to people. They, they were asking me dumb questions. Mm -hmm. I'm a computer programmer and they were asking me what two plus two is. And I got so frustrated. I go, guys, I do algorithms. I I I write code or, you know, I, I write programs for the company I work for. And you're, you guys are asking me simple math, you know, and, and and I ask my wife, can you bring in my laptop? Can you show them what real math is? And, and you know, she caters to me and she brought the laptop and, and I showed them a few of my formulas and they were like, what is that? I go, that is math, not two plus two. Everybody knows that two plus two is five, you know, sarcastic is saying, and then they started laughing. He goes, it's four. I go, I know it's four. I just wanted, I just wanted to make you laugh. <laughs> they asked me if we throw a rock in water, will it sink? And I'm like, come on, guys. You know, unless you throw it in, you know, in the Dead Sea, it's gonna sink, but it's gonna go like this. It's gonna go slow. And they started laughing. They're like, oh my god, this guy. You know, the the, the answer is this guy. This guy is good. This guy, you know, because they were testing my cognitive, you know, yeah. ability, right? Yeah. Well, like, and they left. They pretty much left me alone after that. You know, they yeah. 
then it was just the physical therapy. I couldn't move my arm. I couldn't move my leg. Uh, they they got me out of bed. They tried, you know, uh, they put me in this cage, you know, this walker. I couldn't do the walker. So then they gave me something called the hemi, um, uh, the hemi walker, which it had it's four legs. Uh, it's 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 like a it, it's like a little thing, like a cage, and then you put it to the right, and then I started walking. And and one of the guys, one of the therapists said, "Hey, this, guy, this guy's strong. He can do it. He doesn't need you know. He doesn't need the walker, the the full body walker. He can stand on his feet." And, and then I started walking. I mean, not walking. You know, yeah. I started, started moving. Started moving. Yeah. Yeah. What does your left I, side feel like now? What does it feel like? It it's painful on a daily basis. You know, it's been three, almost three and a half years. It's painful every day. It's different pains. It and it tingles. It it's limp, but it's you know. I can move my, you know, my hand now. I can, I can move my leg. Uh, I mean, I went back to work. See, I had this stroke in May of 2019. Mm -hmm. in, in October of 2019, you know, I, when I went, when I went home, I was in a wheelchair. I was in yeah. a wheelchair for almost, I went, I went home on July 19 of 2019. And, and then, um, then I was on a wheelchair for about a month and a half. And then one day I woke up and I and I told my wife, I'm not getting on a wheelchair again. I'm not. Mm -hmm. And and I, you know, and uh I I had already been walking with a, a four-point cane. And and you know, in the house, I would never stop. I would always be on the move, you know. Uh, so far in three and a half years, I have only fallen four times to the ground. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a record. <laughs> that's, that's good, man. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> and, the time, and the times I, I fell is because I was freaking exhausted because I, yeah. I pushed myself to, yeah. you know. And the first time I went to, uh, I went to my neurologist after I came out of the hospital, he said, what are you doing here? And I go, what do you mean, what am I doing here? He goes, yeah, you're supposed to be dead. You, you don't know, but you cheated death. You know, let me show you your brain. And then he showed me the MRI, showed me the picture of my brain. He goes, look, see all that? That's all blood. He goes, the fact that you're here, you know, standing in front of me with a four-point cane, it's unbelievable. You know, you're supposed to be dead. But... You know, here you are. Here you are arguing with me because I was like arguing with him and telling him, why did, why did I get a stroke? I mean, what happened? I exercised my whole life, never drank. I mean, I used to drink socially. I never smoked. I never used drugs. I was always like, you know, yeah. uh, I'm a workaholic. I love to work. I would wake up at 4 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, you know, work out at, 6 30 i would head to work from 7 a.m until whatever time i was at work and uh, the high blood pressure was an issue for a long time it, it was when uh the doctor said that it was a mixture of high blood pressure and and um the stress that i had gone for many years at work yeah yeah and being an operations manager it's you know responsibility it's a big and it's a big company. I work for Goya, Goya Foods. You know, I I, I I'm in charge of California. You know, I'm second in command in you know in California. Big job. And yeah, and you know, and we uh we're responsible for the whole company in California. Yeah. You know, and and I hadn't how quickly were you able to return to work and how did that go? Oh yeah, that's where I was going. Uh, that was where I was going to get to. So uh, I went home in July of 2019. In October of 2019, I drove for the first time again. You know, like a few months after I had the stroke, I was able. You know, I I I convinced my wife that I that I was I was able to drive, and then she was like, "Okay, let's go in the parking lot. Let's see how you do in the parking lot." And I drove, and then she was like, "Okay, fine." 
So I, I went to I went to a Christmas party too and and uh for the company in, in December of 2019. And then the year after in 2020, I was fed up being at, at, at home. And then I, I asked the doctor, hey, I need to go back to work. And he was he was laughing. He goes, You don't want more time? And I go, No. He goes, you're the opposite to all my other patients. You, you want to go back to work. Everybody begs me for more time at home. And, and I go, no, man, because I I want I want to I want to be I you know, I don't want to be one of those guys that 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 milks the system. I want to go back to work. I want to I want my life to mean something. And he was, I respect that. So I was gonna go back in March of 2020, but that's when the pandemic hit. Yeah, and everything got shut down. So, yeah. uh, I was gonna go back, and then you know, and then they said, "No, let's wait it out," you know, because you know something might happen to you. You already survived a stroke. We don't want you to get COVID and get sick, and yeah. you know, and then that, and and then that dying on us. So, so a few weeks went by. In August, I was gonna go back again. I called the doctor and I said, "Hey, I'm ready. So, give me another letter that I that I'm ready to go back to work." So he sent the letter, he emailed it to me, and then I emailed it back to work. And um, and then I said I was going back, but that's when the second shutdown happened. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, oh my God, and I wanted to go back to work so bad. I was that was sick. I mean, as as much as I love my wife and I didn't want to be home. I, I didn't want to be in a house, you know, confined to nothing, to watching yeah. TV. I, I hated TV back then. And then finally, in September, I, again, I called the doctor and said, you know what? I don't care what, you know, I don't care about COVID. I don't care about anything. I need to go back to work. I cannot stand it here anymore. If I get another stroke, it's because I'm I'm going to get depressed of being in in, in this place. I felt mm-hmm. like I, I was confined to, a, you know, to being home, to watching TV and watch the world go by with nothing. So it was okay, finally. So so I finally went to work in September of the, uh, 2020. You know, went back, you know, uh, in the beginning, people thought, you know, no, he's not going to make it. He's not, you know, he's, you know, they saw me struggling, getting, you know, getting up the steps to the, the to the office and all that stuff. But I proved them wrong. I proved so, them wrong. Sounds like you proved I, everyone wrong so far. That's really good. Uh, Rafa, yeah, I, tell me about I, how it's changed your life. I know it's changed your life physically and the way that your body works and all that. But how has it impacted you on a, you know, on a deeper level? How do you see life now? Because you had this amazing twenty-two day trippy journey as well. So you know, are things different? Do you see things differently now? How do you? Th- how do you see life now? Like, what's it about? Okay, to tell you the truth, I never took life for granted, okay? I always, you know, people who know me, they know that I, I'm i an easygoing guy. I'm very, I care about everybody. I care about life. I care about, you know, life in general. And, uh for me to say that I have a better perspective or another perspective in life, I would be lying because I have the same perspective. Mm-hmm. The only difference is that I went through some experience that that really made me realize that, you know, that um, I don't know if you guys are religious. Uh, I was not religious. I, were, I was very spiritual. But Having gone through what I went through made me, and this is the only thing that actually I can say that that changed a little bit. It made me a bigger believer. Okay, yeah. it did, it did because uh, because I did go to another place. It was real. It was not a dream. It was physical. It was it was there. You know, I felt it. I walked it. I saw these people. Uh, I saw things that I don't know if it was another dimension. Mm. I don't know if it was 
I asked a priest because when I woke up, uh, there was a priest that had been going like on a daily basis because they said that I was I was eventually gonna die. They were waiting for me to die on a daily basis. And this priest kept going and going. And, and when I woke up and I told him the story, first of all, I told him the story and he was awe. He was in awe. He was like, wow, where is this place? And I go, I don't know. And I described it to him and he's all like, oh, wow. He even asked me to look for 22 in the Bible. To, he goes, you know, numbers are very important in the Bible. Look for Sometimes. 22. Yeah. Is there any reference? Yeah. 22 is actually, uh, when I looked, when I looked it up in the Bible, it's it, the number 22. Uh, one of the things that signifies is, is the, uh, uh, how God communicates with us, with a human being. Right. That's the only thing that I gathered from, you know, when I looked it up. And, um, but, you know, my perspective out of life now, it's like, even though I never took it for granted, it's a little bit more meaningful. Like, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, it, it made me respect everything more, you know, and, uh, and not because I'm in this condition, I'm very slow, you know, physically, mm -hmm. cognitively, I'm the same person. Mm -hmm. you know, I never lost one gram of who I used to be. I'm still, you know, I can still you know, reacting, I see people with aphasia, I see people with, um, um, with other conditions after they had their stroke, and thank God I don't have any of that. You and know? and how, so you're a, did you go back to your work in the same capacity as you were before as the operations manager? And how has your physical condition impacted the way you deliver on your job? Okay, so when I went back, you know, first of all, you know, the CEO uh, of the company, uh, you know, reassured me, hey, you're, you, because uh, uh, I asked him, hey, uh, if I, if I get better, can I go back to work? And he goes, yes, by all means, we need you, we want you back. Once you get, you know, better, you, you know, you don't have to worry about your job, it's going to be there, just get better. Just wait it out, get better and go back to work. So when I went back to work, because I was slow, I went into my office and I was like, oh my God, you know, how do I, oh, and then the owner of the CEO, which is my boss now, you know, he told me, hey, um, you know, now uh, the difference is, the difference now between back then and uh, when, before you had the stroke is now that you have a bunch of people that are going to be helping you. You're gonna have you're gonna have, you're gonna have a bunch of like you know um, people that will assist you do the wow. hard labor, you know. And I go okay, so I went in the same capacity. They 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 didn't block anything. They were just watching me, and I I felt you know. And one day I I overheard someone saying, "Hey, you know, he's not. He's just gonna be here for a few days, and then he's gonna leave because it's too much." <laughs> and 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 I was like, you know, I didn't want them to, or, or to know that I that I eavesdropped on their conversation. And uh, but I but I thought, nah, I'm gonna show these people that I'm. You're gonna prove them wrong as well. <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna prove them that I'm here, that I'm back. What about fatigue? What about cognitive fatigue? A lot of stroke survivors do struggle with cognitive fatigue, especially. I did when I sat down in front of a computer screen for the first time after brain surgery, mm -hmm. and that was hard. And it was hard for about a year and a half, two years. So what was it like for you? The only fatigue I have is physical. Uh, if I get in front of a computer, and especially, you know, the, the whole time that I was in, 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 in you know, in, in my house, I, you know, I love Excel. You know, Microsoft Excel is to me like the greatest program in the world. Wow. It probably is true. But there's so many people who I know who like, who love Excel and just do things. I look at Excel and I just want to go to sleep. It just puts me to sleep. I can't deal with that kind of stuff. Too much cognitive effort 
for for me to use Excel, right? So I just I've never used it for what it's for what it is designed to be used for. And then uh -huh. I meet people like you who go, "Oh my God, Excel this and Excel that." And I know that it's powerful, but my God, what a learning, what a skill to learn! It's such a hard skill to learn. I can draw and get and you know in Excel draw. <laughs> I can draw pictures. I can do, I, I can create formulas that will, you know, draw a picture. Wow. I, I have created this crazy, um, you know, spreadsheets that they have been used. You know, I, I ran into the spreadsheet the other day, uh, you know, uh, that I created for, a, for an account, you know, for the accountants, you know, like 15, 16 years ago. And then I looked at the formulas and 16 years ago was, different you know uh, you had to create these crazy formulas to make you know a, a spreadsheet work and i looked at the formula that i created back then and, I'm like, and i was like oh my god how in the hell did i create that formula mm -hmm. and it was so weird and they're still using it to the day you know from 16 years ago even though there's so many other things so many you know easier things and, and what they said when I went back, he goes, oh, Ralph makes our life a little easier because he makes everything dummy, uh, dumb, dummy proof, you know, that I, yeah. you know, they, I, I give him a, a spreadsheet and everything is there. They don't have to ask me for anything. So the fatigue, man, that's good that you get. No, I, I don't have any fatigue. Cognitive fatigue, no, uh, fatigue, I don't. That's brilliant. I don't have any. Yeah. No, physical, very, very physical, rare. yeah. Yeah, no, I I don't have and 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 I had the uh what's it called the the craniotomy, you know, craniotomy, I had it. I have my scar right here. Well, yeah. I have long hair because I don't want people to see my scar. Yeah. But uh, uh, I guess they say the right side of my brain is completely gone, like a quarter of the brain is completely gone. And, uh, but I think I have, I have been using the left side of my brain my whole life because mm. I woke up and I, I remember everything and, and I'm like, I'm like, a little, I would, I'm, I'm I would like love to life. see your scans. I would love to see your scans. If you've got them, it sounds like they are worth looking at. Um, I asked my but, doctor, I've been meaning to ask the doctor for them, but my wife always tells me, why, why do you want to see that? I loved I've loved looking at my scans, seeing where the blood was, and trying to understand what happened there. Didn't bother me at all. It was really, it was really interesting. <laughs> Excuse you. me, thank you. It was what, really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, what to see them. Do, do you have, or do you do you did you experience? So I had a brain hemorrhage as well um, near the cerebellum uh, on the right side, from about two inches in from my ear. Okay. And um, I had to learn how to walk again, use my left side again. Uh -huh. I still have the tingles and numbness and the cold sensation on my left side and the tightness in the muscles. So I still have all of the deficits. That was in 2014 was surgery. Um, so, yeah, it's been a bit of a... Uh, and, but then I, I experienced, you know, a lot of cognitive fatigue, physical fatigue, a lot, a lot of issues there. It took it took a long time, but they got better as I started to get uh, better and healthier and more physically fit. Everything came back, uh, but still, all my deficits are there. All the things that I feel on my left side are all mm -hmm. still there, are still there, you know. Um, and that's why I'm just when do you? I'm amazed uh -huh. that you that you got to be and the damage in my brain is probably the size of a golf ball at the, mo at the most you know you're telling me a very large percentage of your brain is damaged and i'm thinking well that's that's what i'm saying that's a scan i'd love to see because i'm speaking to the man and then i want to see <laughs> you know i want to see what it looks like and that's maybe that's why all your doctors are amazed you shouldn't be around well, my uh, my nearest surgeon, or you know, he's he's he told me he goes, you know, it's amazing that because you're not you were supposed to wake up, not being able to talk, walk, or even reason. 
And and here you are arguing with me. I, oh, I'll tell you another story. So one day I'm going, he told me, he, he, he calls me on the phone. Then he tells me, hey, I, you know, usually I have my nurses call my patients to tell them good news, but you are a special case. So I'm calling you personally. And I, and I go, what's up? And then he goes, well, you know, that, that, that little, and I forget the name of it, but it's like the beginning of an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me, you know, that condition that we're looking at and we're, we're going to watch for years. And I told you that we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to keep an eye on it. And I go, yeah. He, go, oh, he goes, oh, first of all, let me tell you that I have a colleague here because I want him, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to talk to you as well. He wanted to get to know you. He wants to know you too. He, he's amazed at your story. And do you mind if I have him on the phone? I don't know. I, I don't mind. So he's, they, they, they were both talking to me. And then he goes, you know, that, that, that aneurysm that we're so worried about. And I told you that we're going to keep an eye on it. It's not there no more. And I wanted to give you the news myself. He goes, so congratulations. It's not there no more. So we don't have to worry about it. And I go, oh, that's great. You know, I, I was relieved because I don't want to go through this again, right? Yeah. And then uh, and then he goes, yeah, and where are you at? And I go, oh, I'm on my way to work. And he goes, you, what do you mean you're on your way to work? Yeah. I go, I'm driving. I'm going to work right now. And he goes, and he has a potty mouth. And he goes, get the F out of here. You're driving? And I go, yeah, I drive to work every day. He goes, no, but you're driving and talking to me. And then I go, yeah, you know, you call me. <laughs> and then he's like, and then I heard him say, didn't I tell you about this guy? And, <laughs> and, and then I started laughing. And then he goes, this guy's amazing. And I'm, and I'm laughing. And at the same time, I'm, I'm feeling proud. I'm like, oh, man, they're, you know, they're praising me. And, I, and that feels good. You should be and, proud, man. You should be proud. Whatever the reason is that you're here, it's great that you're here. It's great that it worked out really well doesn't often work out very well for people like us, man. Sometimes, look, nobody, the people on the on my podcast are the survivors. You know, it's the recovery after stroke podcast. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't survive this stuff. And that's the reality. So this podcast is for the survivors so that we can encourage people to get back to life. Chase and it. By all, fight and by for all it. means. I, I will do anything to encourage yeah. people because yeah. some people get sick because they get depressed. Yeah. And I understand I was depressed for a few days that, that I couldn't move, that I, yeah. you know, I couldn't, I went back to the gym and I tried lifting weights and I couldn't, Not, I couldn't even lift one pound, man. Yeah. You know, when I was benching, I, one time I benched, you know, um, uh, I, I did five repetitions of 320 pounds on the bench. And I was like, I was so, you know, I mean, I'm only five, eight and, 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 and people in the gym were all like, Oh, wow. This little freaking guy can lift all that weight. And now I wake up and I can't even lift my own weight. Mm -hmm. You know? So that was depressing. Yeah. And I was depressed for, I was I was not depressed at all. Okay, I was depressed for about a half hour, and my my thing in my head was like, I need to get up. I need to yeah. get on with my life. I I cannot stay in bed. I cannot lay in bed. Yeah, and that's been my that's been that's what motivates me that I want to get on with my life. I don't want to be uh, in a wheelchair. I don't want to be you know, uh, not being able to do anything. Yeah. I want to fend for myself, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I'm lucky. I have a beautiful wife and she's helped me through the whole process. Uh, the, um, people that helped me out, the therapists, they were great. I had like the greatest therapists in the world and they were, and they were funny too. They were like, Oh my God. Everybody wants to help you out because, you know, you go to another person and they don't want to get out of bed. I mean, you, you're always looking at the door, you know, and waiting for us to say, hey, Ralph, let's go. And, and that, that was my, you know, that was my thing. And, uh, and, and 
if anybody wants to hear my story and if I can encourage people, trust me, I will. Yeah. Because and 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 I see you and, and you look normal to me and you look perfect. <laughs> I'm I'm far from normal, but yeah, I do. I it doesn't look like anything is wrong with me, but that that's one of my challenges is when you see me, you you see the same person that I was before all of my three brain hemorrhages and brain surgery and learning how to walk again. <clears throat> so the challenge that I had was because I looked so well, I couldn't explain to people how I was feeling. And then that was very difficult for me, frustrating. And people would have bigger expectations of me because they they don't understand. And then it's like, I don't know how to get the message across yet. It's really, really difficult. So this morning I woke up, my left side is hurting a lot today. I'm not sure why. I didn't sleep at all last night. That might be one of the reasons. Uh -huh. And and I don't know. And, and that means that today I'm going to be tired all day and I'm going to be different all day. But I can't explain that to somebody that just don't get it. When I, I used to be tired beforehand, because I didn't sleep, it, it didn't really affect my day to day. It didn't really impact me. I was just tired, but I was able to be fully functioning and fully productive and do all the things I need to do. Now I can't, I can't be productive when I haven't had a good night's sleep and when my left side hurts, uh, or the whole left side hurts. And then when you can't see it and I have to, interact with people and I can't explain it to them. It's just so hard. And it's just, it's, the, it's just one of those things. I, I don't know. It's frustrating, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's frustrating. And that's one of the reasons for the podcast is because with the podcast, I, I get to speak to two people a week or one person a week who gets me, who understands me. I understand them. They understand me. It's like my therapy. Um, uh, my family, I don't never want them to understand because there's only one way for them to understand. So I kind of accept it, but I wish I could just get the message across just so that they could give me a break on the day when I needed it. If I could just, today is the day I need a break because of that reason that you can't see that's bothering me, that's making me feel unwell. If I could just get that over the line easier would be fantastic, but I do what I can and they, they do what they can. We've come a long way. It's taken, you know, it's a 10 year journey so far for me, 11 years this year. So we are, we're getting further along and I don't do things the way I used to do them before. We can't, we can't do them the same. I can't personally do them the same. So it's a new approach to my day it's a new approach to my life it's a new approach to uh everything so what about you in what way do you think you changed after having the stroke what 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 do you what do you treasure the most now or what's more important to you now than than before i used to believe i used to have bad beliefs of that i wasn't capable of doing something or able to achieve something or that's good for them to do that, but that's not something that I can do. You know, I used to have that type of negative self-talk and I, I used to struggle to ask for help. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't really believe in myself. I, I listened to the people who were negative in their approach to me. And I took their advice instead of the people who were positive and supportive. And it used to really make me angry and frustrated so I used to take my anger and frustration out of my family usually my kids uh, it was disguised as discipline it was disguised as I was being disciplined and disciplining them and teaching them the correct way and all that but it wasn't it was more anger and me not knowing how to behave like a 37 year old evolved human being i was just behaving like a child you know 18 year old child that never really grew up and um after the first and second bleeds i really started to take notice that i might not be around so what i need to do 
is I need to make things right with the people that are important to me because I love them. I just didn't know how to do to show love correctly because uh -huh. I, I loved them and I didn't want them thinking that dad was always an angry guy, you know, if he died, if I died and I didn't want him to think that that's all they remembered, you know, I want them to remember better things than that. So I, I put a lot of things right. I apologize to a lot of people. Um, and now I don't, now I, I, now I sit in the struggle of not knowing how to do something. So recently I finished the first draft of my book and that was a year and a half of writing and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was such a difficult thing because of those cognitive issues that I have, my brain gets fried really easily. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have to find windows where I'm feeling really, really well and then just sit down for as long as I can and write as much as I can. That That's a guy who has never written more than maybe one or two essays in his life, didn't study, didn't do homework, uh, hardly set my exams, you know, actually made a lot of effort to fail at school and not do well because I just hated it. I just couldn't. I, I'm not sure if it's a learning if it's a learning thing, I don't know what, what it was, but I could not sit in a classroom and obtain information from my teachers and from my books and absorb it and actually do anything with it. I have other ways of learning. So YouTube for me is a godsend, you know, um, listening to books instead of reading books is far better for me because I can't, the pages off the, getting the pages, the words off the pages and into my brain is really hard. I've got to often go back and double read and triple read that page and trying to absorb that information. So even though I have all of those challenges, some of them are in my own mind, some of them I've created, who knows how I got to be that way. But even though that was that, I don't, I don't it doesn't bother me now that something is hard and difficult. I'll sit through it, I'll find a way, I'll overcome it. And um, the book I started writing in COVID lockdown in Australia, we had so many of them and in Melbourne, we were locked down for two years, properly locked down. Um, I started writing it as a thing, something to do like you. I can't be at home all day, every day for months after months after months, which is what we were and not do anything. So I thought I'm going to write a book. And when we got back to work, I think we finally got back to work. All the lockdowns ended in September 2021. 20, then the book started to take a back seat. And I started trying to find time on the weekend to write it. But it was always on my mind. I've come so far. I've done seven out of 10 chapters. You know, I've got, I've wow. got to do the next one. I've got to do the next one. And I've got to do the next one. And it was never, it never left my mind. The hardest thing I've ever had to do for the first time ever, it was always on my mind that I have to do this. I can't not do it. So it's just that I've got this opportunity to be alive still. And I've, I've got the support to write the book. So I had a book coach. I had encouragement. I knew the book chapters. I had people coming out of everywhere telling me how... Um, telling me that they were happy to support me. I wasn't going to let that opportunity go. I was going to definitely put something in writing and, and get it out, you know. And mm -hmm. what was also interesting was the the working title of the book is Stroke, The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me. And it's clear that it is because I have a podcast where I talk to people around the world. You know, we get nearly 6,500 downloads a month. Uh, we get feedback from people all the time who are telling me why the podcast is necessary and how it's helping them. Uh, I'm coaching people to overcome some of the challenges that they have with stroke. Uh, I mean, you know, there's no, nothing bad has come out of this stroke. If I, with my body, most of the days are days where I can manage and I can cope and I can overcome the pain and the numbness and all that kind of stuff, you know, so it's all good. So when, 
when the opportunity comes to do something now, I just take it. I just do it. Whereas before I would tell myself, it's not for you, Bill. You can't do this. It's for other people to write books. You, you're not a book writer. I never used to be a podcaster either, but here I am. I'm a podcaster <laughs> now, you know? So that's kind of how my life changes. My my perspective is completely different. And now I just go after everything. I just don't really care how long it's going to take or what the obstacles are. I've learned that the obstacles are the way to the solution. Like once you reach an obstacle, that's the path you must take. You must overcome that obstacle and keep going forward, you know? Um, and what right. was interesting was when I asked the people on Instagram, my Instagram at recovery after stroke has got five and a half thousand followers. So when I ask them, uh, is there other people that tell me strokes, the best thing that ever happened to them, you know, people put their hand up and said, yeah, that's me and me and me and me. So when I interviewed them to find out what the things were that we had in common, how did we get to say that? What was similar about that? The 10 chapters came up. I saw that there was at least 10 common things that they did, which is what I did. And those those things became the chapters. So how can you not write that book? People need to know that many people are early on in their journey and they might not appreciate that it's shit. It's hard. It's challenging. It's changed your life. It's taken stuff from you. Uh, it's done all these things. But maybe, maybe down the road, maybe we can look back on it and we can see that we've had some post-traumatic growth instead of post-traumatic stress, instead of depression, instead of all that stuff. Maybe we can look back and go, even though it took all this stuff, it still gave me all of this other other stuff. You know, so... I'm hoping that that's what it's going to inspire people to think, to think that let's focus on the positives, what else we can get out of that. I always think about Stephen Hawking, man. Stephen Hawking, that physicist, you know, he had motor neurons disease or something like that. And from mm -hmm. the his mid-30s, he wasn't able to move any part of his body and do anything. And he still became one of the world's greatest physicists. Yeah. And he's written books and he's like, the most amazing person that we ever we've ever heard about that made movies about him. I always think about that guy. And then I'm wondering if, if stroke survivors just look at what Stephen Hawking was able to achieve and they achieved just one one hundredth of what he achieved. It will be an amazing story. Yeah. No, I, that's, you know, and like I said, you know, we struggle you and I and every everyone who has had a stroke, we struggle. But that's it. It's just a struggle. Hmm. It's uh we're alive. We you should keep going, you know. Feeling sorry about yourself is not gonna take you anywhere, it's not gonna leave you anywhere. Yeah. You know, it's life needs to go on. And you get to only be alive once. That that's the one thing that I really learned, Rafa. It's mm -hmm. it's only going to be one time I'm going to be on this planet like this now. So you know what? Exactly. You know what the yeah, hell? I was, I was just going to say that to you. We only get one chance at this. Yeah, that's it. And uh, you know, one of the things that I. I mean, I always watch the Discovery Channel, the all the Learning Channel documentaries. I mean, I'm I, I was a nerd since I was a little kid, right? But now with the new telescope, you know, and uh, and the pictures of the universe and how big the universe is and how meaningful it is, you know, even a split second in the universe, as small as we are, mm. as that second is very meaningful. Whether you're in the universe, whether you're on Earth, or whether you're in a different dimension, you know, but every second counts. It could be meaningful and it could be deeply meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had people on here who have aphasia and they can hardly talk, but they still came on my podcast. It's uh -huh. technically having somebody who has aphasia on a podcast is 
not the right approach because it's a talking medium. You, you, what are you supposed to do with somebody who can't talk on a podcast? But that's well, exactly... You don't even know what kind of effort they're, they're trying that's to it. communicate with you and, and they're calling things different, you know, that's because I, I, met, I met a gentleman with a face shot at a Starbucks and, and he was trying to tell me, you know, I gathered just maybe 80% of what he was trying to tell me. Yeah. He was so happy to see me and we that's had it. the same, you know, condition and he was struggling on the left and he saw me and and he waved at me, he came, he hugged me, and then yeah. he goes, did you have your stroke? And I told him, and he has, he, see, that's when I, that's about a year after my stroke. And uh, he said that he had gotten his stroke 15 years before. And, and then he was so happy to see me. And, and then, you know, we kind of like, I teared up a little bit, he did too, kind of cried. And, and, and we were, he's still my friend and, uh, and, I think Facebook and yeah. Instagram. Yeah. And we follow each other. We make fun of each other. And, and and I know. And then he sends me this text that I don't know what he's saying, but you know, but I always, you know, send him like smileys that, you know, yeah. I'm laughing because I know he's trying to tell me something. And and it's that's beautiful. awesome. That's exactly and that's it. That's my point. You know, that's you have a podcast and you have somebody who has aphasia who can't talk or communicate the way they used to. That's the perfect person to have on a podcast i absolutely love it i mean the fact that we're just going to have people on who can speak clearly and all that is ridiculous everybody needs to be on the podcast because yeah. that's the whole point of it the whole point of it is to give people a platform and to allow them to express themselves and to find a way to express themselves which is different from the majority of us but it's even if it's unique to them it's still what you said. It's still important. It's still impactful. It still yeah. has a lot of deep meaning. It, it's relevant. It's necessary, you know? So it's like, that's, 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 I can't even describe it, but that's, that, in, that lights me up to be able to be that guy where somebody had decided to have the courage to overcome their aphasia. And to come onto my podcast to do that. And it's like, fantastic, man. That's brilliant. I love it. I can't, I can't get over that. I just, it really fills my heart to know that that's a possibility now for people with aphasia, you know, whereas before all this internet stuff, Zoom and before we couldn't connect, you and I would never have met each other. I mean, it's the best time to be on the planet. I know there's stuff going wrong, but there always has been, but it's never been a better time to be on the planet. Uh, uh, yes, I totally agree. Where, where are you from? Where, where, what part of the world are you in? I'm in Melbourne, in Australia. Awesome. When you were... My, my, I have an uncle who lives in Queensland. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why you were thinking that you were in Australia when you, when you woke no, up. Tell you what, one of the places that I, that I went to during my coma was Australia. I thought I was in Australia somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm telling you, I was there for months. And I walked the streets of LA. Then I was living. <laughs> then I, it, it comes and goes that I remember things. I was living in a trailer in the wilderness. And, <laughs> and there, was a, there was a river. And then it was Australia. And I was like, wow, this is up there. And who knows? Maybe, doesn't you know, matter. Maybe you were everywhere. You're everywhere. I was, you know, the mind is something beautiful. Yeah. You know, we we create these things with our, in, you know, in our head. And I guess I was entertaining myself while I was in a coma. Who knows? Perfect. Rafa, man, I really appreciate you connecting and uh, coming yeah. on the podcast. I love your story. It's an amazing story. I'm so glad that you proved everybody wrong and they're going to keep doing that. And um, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. And good job. You're doing a great deed. Thanks for joining us on today's episodes to learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. 
If you would like to try out the course five foods to avoid after stroke, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash courses and get on board now. If you would like to support this podcast, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, please comment below the video, like the episode and to get future episodes, hit the notifications bell and subscribe to the show. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor or care for someone who is a stroke survivor or you're one of the fabulous people that help stroke survivors. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the contact form. And as soon as I receive your request, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for me and you to meet over Zoom. Thanks again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.